during the American Revolution, uh, which is the War of Independence from the rule of England, there was a man who was dressed in civilian clothes, and he was riding on a horse, and he passed by a battlefield. And he saw a soldier, a corporal, with some other men, and these men, they were repairing a barrier or a defensive wall. Now this corporal, we know that the corporal is the, we could say, from the lowest would be the second, okay, second to the last in terms of rank. But we find this corporal, he was giving orders to those who were much lower than in the privates. He was telling them what to do, okay, that they need to do this, do that, uh, in order to repair the barrier. However, this corporal did not lift a single finger to help them. And so this man on the horse asked why the corporal was not helping. And this corporal replied proudly, I am a corporal. And so this man apologized to him, got down from his horse, and then started to help the exhausted soldiers to fix this barrier. Afterwards, this man got back on his horse and said to the corporal, the next time, if you have a job like this and not enough men to do it, go to your commander-in-chief and I will come and help you again. This man was none other than George Washington, who was the commander-in-chief of the American military. Today we continue our series entitled The Images of Discipleship. And this morning we look into the subject of servanthood as symbolized by the power. A moment ago we read a passage that we are very familiar with. It's a passage about servanthood. Unfortunately, servanthood is something that we are familiar with and yet it is very hard for us to do. And there are at least two reasons that I can think of why we are reluctant to serve. First, it's because we usually pick whom we want to serve. If we like a person, we will gladly serve them. If we don't like them, then we would either shun them or when we do something for them, you know, we do it grudgingly. And probably we even wish inside of us that we didn't have to do it in the first place. So we usually pick whom we want to serve. Second, we prefer to be at the end of people's service. In other words, we want others to serve us. We want to benefit from others. But then at the very heart, I think the problem is that it is because we do not have the mindset of Jesus Christ. That is why we react this way. We don't have the mindset of Christ. That's why we serve grudgingly at times. That's why we prefer to be at the end of people's service. And so today we look at this subject again of servanthood. And we want to look at the ultimate model of Jesus Christ. And he has left for us a very good model from the passage that we read a moment ago in John chapter 13. We want to understand what was the mindset that the Lord has demonstrated and why we should adopt this mindset so that we can be truly God's servants. And we want to be constantly reminded also that true disciples of Jesus Christ must always have with them the figurative power, the attitude, the heart of a servant. I'd like to begin by setting again the context for our passage. We all know that when Jesus uh, did the action of washing his disciples' feet, it was actually the night before he was to suffer and to be crucified. And together with the, the twelve, they were commemorating the Passover in the upper room. And most likely, uh, this house okay, belonged to a family that was very sympathetic towards Jesus and his apostles and they generously allowed them to use a space in their home which is often called the upper room or the second floor of the house. Usually the 
what we call as the upper room is an extension of their house because back then most of their homes were just single story home so most likely this was the, the roofing which then they extended they put another roofing on top so this was what we would call as the upper room and most likely it was the house of uh, the parents of John Mark because later on we would learn that uh, John uh, John Mark was involved somewhat in the story if you read the account of Mark and we know that John Mark later on would also become a follower of Jesus Christ and in fact become uh, one of his servants one of those who Paul and of course Peter trusted now during that night the tensions were very high because in Luke chapter 22 it recorded that the apostles were disputing among themselves who was the greatest among them and maybe the apostles were jockeying to become the leader of the apostolic band now we don't know exactly the reason why this issue of greatness was brought about during the Passover but I believe that the issue has already persisted for some time and so they have been arguing arguing among themselves who is the greatest and they would be saying no I am or probably the other would say I am so they would keep on jockeying and saying I am the greatest now let's talk about the washing of the feet the washing of the feet was necessary in ancient Palestine because people back then wore sandals and they walked on dusty or muddy roads and the washing of the feet is a very menial or lowly task that is done by slaves and usually this is the task that is given to the youngest or the least trained slaves and it is possible that since the Lord and his apostles could not afford a slave the apostles had to share in doing certain tasks like a good example in Luke 22 Jesus had given instructions to Peter and to John to go and prepare for the Passover feast however I don't think that they washed each other's feet before and we're not even sure why there was no servant around that evening because they were staying at the house of John Mark and most likely they would be able to afford a servant but nevertheless the host was unable to provide one and so it was in this setting that we find that the people they were arguing among themselves who was the greatest and so Jesus answered them in Luke 22 he told them that the greatest should be the one who serves not the one who lords it over however even as Jesus said those words the disciples kept on arguing most likely and so that was when Jesus decided to use this very powerful illustration to help them realize the all important lesson of selflessly serving one another now before we look at the act of foot washing and its significance I want first to pay attention as to why the Lord would wash his apostles feet like a slave there are three things that the text tells us first of all Jesus could wash the feet of the apostles was because he was confident of his identity although he was the Lord he was the master and yet he could wash their feet without hesitation and this is found in verse 3 because in verse 3 it says Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power he knew that he was the Son of God he has been given authority from God he was secure in his identity that he was the Son of God such that he could go about doing something that is very menial and very lowly at that time he knew that acting in such a way will not diminish his being the son of God and so he was confident about his identity and this point is very important for us you see we often have this wrong mentality about doing lowly tasks 
we think that doing such tasks diminishes our identity. In our minds, CEOs of big companies aren't supposed to be ushers in a church service. That's how we think. We think that those who are CEOs, those who are heads of companies, of industries, they're supposed to be standing here as worship leaders or as MCs or even as speakers. We also have this mistaken notion, intelligent people should be teaching Sunday school. They should be leading discipleship groups, not distributing church bulletins. We avoid doing the menial task because we think our self-esteem will suffer. But when you look at the Lord Jesus, you'll find that He was confident in who He was, that it did not bother Him at all. That he, could, that he had to do something very lowly, like washing the feet of his apostles. You see, to wash their feet wasn't going to make him any less the Son of God. The late uh, Dane Thomas, the founder of Wendy's, he was known for his humble service within this very successful business that he started. And he was once asked, what was the secret of his success? And he replied, my MBA. Now, he was not referring to a graduate degree in business administration. I think some of us, we've gone through the MBA program. We know what an MBA is. But his version of the MBA is different. Instead, what he meant was, MBA, the mop and bucket attitude. The mindset of a servant. That's what he was trying to point out. In other words, for Dave Thomas, there is no task that is too insignificant for him to tackle. The task may be small, it may get you dirty, but then the most important thing is just simply jump in and get the job done. Now, what many of us maybe don't we don't know is that Dave Thomas was a high school dropout. And so when he started Wendy's and when Wendy's became successful, he could have covered up for his inadequacies by, you know, demanding every perks and privilege that could be accorded to him. But instead, he continued with that attitude, mop and bucket. That means serve other people. Do the menial tasks. Do the things that will make the business more successful. In Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 to 11, we find this great hymn that is written about Jesus Christ. Jesus is described as being in his very nature God, and yet he never considered himself, uh, his being God, as something that he had to hold on to desperately. But the verse then says, instead he willingly took on the form of a servant. All of us, when we have faith in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, we become His children. And this identity can never be taken away from us. And so when we do menial tasks, when we do things that we seem lowly to the world, it will not take away our status of being God's children, as God's sons and daughters. Our self-work should never diminish when we are doing service that is like that of the towel or service of the mop and bucket. Now the second reason why Jesus could serve in such a way was because he understood that this was the fullest expression of love. In verse 1, we find that Jesus here is a description of Jesus where it says, Having loved his own who were in the world, he now showed them the full extent of his love. Truth be told, you will never know how much a person really loves you until such time that he willingly serves you. Because he could talk a lot about serving others, about serving you. He could talk a lot about sacrifice. But then his behavior could contradict his talk. You know, Jesus could have simply said, I love you very much to the disciples. 
and they would have believed his word. After all, he was their master. But then Jesus decided that he wanted to use his action to speak to the apostles. He was going to use an action to teach them an object lesson. Now we can proclaim out loud that we love people. But again, words are very cheap. Because the world wants to see us showing love through our actions. They want to see us taking up the towel in order to serve others. The Apostle John would later on write in 1 John chapter 3, verses 17 and 18. He would write, But if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, and yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? Little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and in truth. Love is best seen through our actions and not through our words. And then thirdly, Jesus could wash his apostles' feet because he realized the urgency of time. In verses 1 and 3, it says that Jesus knew that the time had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father, that he had come from God and was returning to God. He knew that he was going to go back to the Father very soon. And so he had to teach them this one more lesson, a lesson that they should always remember. It's the same with us. It's important that we leave behind a legacy to those who will come after us. You see, our time here on earth is short. It is also unpredictable. That is why it's important that we leave something valuable to them. And when I say valuable, I'm not just talking about material things, but rather I'm talking more about the important lessons of life. I'm talking about faith, transferring our faith to the next generation. So it's important that we leave something valuable to the next generation. And this thing of value is something that we want them to remember. And so Jesus wanted them to remember the lesson of servanthood before he leaves them. Because that was what he came here for. He came in order not to be served, but to serve others. Another lesson we can learn here according to the Bible commentator William Barclay, was that it was when Jesus knew he was going to return to God that he performed his service to the apostles, doing the work of a lonely slave. You see, a person who knows that his time here on earth is limited and that soon he will see his master and savior should not shun doing lonely work for others. But he should be willing to serve even if the work being done seems menial or insignificant. Now let's learn a couple of lessons about service from Jesus. The first lesson he wants us to learn is that he served without fanfare. In verses 4 and 5, we find that Jesus simply got up, took off his outer clothing, and then wrapped the towel around his waist, and then he began to wash the feet of his disciples. He did not announce what he was doing. He did not even say a word while he was washing their feet. He just started doing it. He did not call attention to them. He did not say to them, see, I'm washing your feet. Okay. Here we could see that his motive for service was pure. He was serving without fanfare. He was not calling people to pay attention to him in a negative way. In the January 27 uh, devotion of our daily bread, there's this story that was written by the author about visiting his uh, old alma mater, Purdue University. And it was during the winter time. And as he was passing by one of the fraternity houses, he noticed that there were two people who were chipping off the ice from the pavement. And this author began to think that, oh, this is probably, these two are probably, you know, uh, what we call as plebes. You know, plebes are the new people who join the fraternity. You know, they're usually in Tagalog, Tutusan. 
we're supposed to do this, do that, okay, for the head or for the upper class men. And so uh, he said to the two, two, two young men, he said, oh, so you've been assigned to do this, huh? And then the two young men just smiled, and then the, the first one said, I'm the vice president of the fraternity, and he's the president of the fraternity. They were upper class men, and not just upper class men, they were the head of that fraternity. And yet, what were they doing? They were doing the work that would usually be assigned to the new people joining a fraternity. So we could see that here, here were two, two men. They were quietly doing their work. They did not announce to everyone, oh, we're the president and vice president of the fraternity. See what we're doing. We're so humble. They did not do that. They did not announce it. It was only when they were asked that they then commented who they were. And so, when we serve the Lord, we have to remember that we should not brag about it. Don't announce to others that you're doing something for them. Because when you let the whole world know what you're doing, then your service is nothing more than self-promotion. And it's not humble, true service to others. It's all about uh, propping yourself up rather than truly serving people. So do not announce what you're doing to others. So examine yourself when you serve the Lord. Are you unduly calling attention to yourself? Or are you serving because you genuinely want to help? You see, the person who calls attention to himself will usually not settle for ministries that are menial. But they want the things that will put them in the limelight. It is not that these ministries are wrong, the ministries here upstage, but that they can become a snare to people who do not have the right perspective about serving God and others. And so remember, do not call attention to yourself when you serve. Secondly, Jesus served on his own initiative. You'll notice that he did not wait for someone to volunteer. The fact is none of them were willing. They were already arguing among themselves who was the greatest. So there was no one who was going to volunteer. So he did not wait because they were too proud to want to do such a menial task. So Jesus just immediately went into action with no one else prompting him except most likely the Holy Spirit. Very often, we serve when we are prompted by others or even pleaded by others to do so. And when we get bypassed, when people don't ask us, then we don't serve at all. You see, we have, this, uh, we have this wrong perspective. We always want to feel needed by others. There will always be a need out there that has to be addressed. But it doesn't have to be a formal ministry of the church or inside the church. You see, when you see someone in need, we have to take the initiative to do something. We don't wait for someone to have to push us or to nudge us and tell us that we need to do something. Don't wait to take up the power of service. Instead, let us initiate service towards others. And so that was the pattern that Jesus sets clearly for us. When we see the need, address that need on our initiative. So when we see the needs of people inside the church or outside of the church, don't wait for others to say something to you. But instead, spring into action. Do what is necessary. And so evaluate yourself. Am I taking the initiative to meet the needs of the church? Or to meet the needs of people outside of the church? Or do I always have to wait for someone to tell me that there's a need? So this coming week, okay, this is your assignment. What service can I render to the Lord? that I should take initiative in doing? Who is the one person that God is asking me to help 
that I had delayed for a long time in helping. And so when God tells you to serve Him and others, be quick to obey, take that initiative to serve. Finally, Jesus served in order to leave us a correct model. In verses 12 to 17, Jesus then took the time to explain why he washed the feet of his apostles. He said, Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. That is the model of ministry that Jesus wants for us to adopt. It is to have that attitude of a servant when it comes to our relationship with others, whether it's a believer or someone who is not yet a follower of Jesus Christ. Admittedly, very few people among us, even probably even myself, we don't want to be a servant. We prefer others to serve us. But Jesus stressed it very well in Mark chapter 9, verse 35. He says, Anyone who wants to be first must be the very last and the servant of all. There are many people who come to church who don't want to be servants. We would prefer to pay someone to do the work. We hire janitors, drivers, and even pastors to do the work that we are capable of doing but reluctant of doing. There is nothing wrong with hiring people to work in the church. There is nothing wrong calling on board a pastor to serve. But then, just because you have professionals working in the church does not mean that you are off the hook when it comes to service. You know, one of the one of the things that I admire about our daughter church is that every member participates in some kind of service, whether it is formal or informal. You see, they don't really have a janitor in their church. And so every Sunday, it is the members who, who begin to spread out the chairs, and it is also the members who stack up all the chairs after the service. Of course, it's hard for us to do that. We're using cues, okay? We, we don't stack them up, okay? But then there are things that we can do here in church or even outside of the church where we can serve followers of Christ as well as those who do not yet know Jesus Christ. The Lord's pattern for the church, for His people, is not that just a few of us will take up the power. His pattern is that all of us will take up the power of service. You see, if the Master, if our Master came in order to serve us and to serve others, then we, as His followers, have to do the same thing. And so let us evaluate ourselves. Do I have the attitude of a servant just as Jesus demonstrated? Am I really following the model of Christ or am I only interested in benefiting from the service of others? Again, uh, I want you to have this assignment. Think of a person who exemplifies servanthood for you. Think of what this person does that makes you admire him or her. Then maybe you can take time to talk to that person and learn how they serve. And you could even ask them to take you under their wings in their area of service and teach you how to be involved in it. Okay, so think about a person who exemplifies servanthood and maybe become that person's apprentice. Serve with him. In closing, the Lord Jesus exemplified what loving service is all about when he washed the feet of his apostles. And the towel is a reminder of that service. We know, first of all, that he served without fanfare. He served on his own initiative, and that he served in order to give us a correct model. 
he was able to serve because he was confident about his identity. Because he knew that this was the fullest expression of his love and because he knew that time was of the essence. My prayer for all of us is that we will follow the model of Jesus. That we will uh, follow his pattern of serving. You see, if we are, if we call ourselves the disciples of Jesus Christ, we can do no less than to serve just like our Lord. And so, I want us all to take time later today, evaluate yourself, evaluate what am I doing? Am I truly serving the Lord? Am I using my gifts, my talents, my skills in order to serve the body of Christ as well as to serve those who are outside of the body in order to show them the genuine love of Jesus Christ? And also, always remember the towel. Always bring it with you. I'm not talking about the literal towel, but bring with you the figurative towel, the attitude of the servant. Spirit. Father, we thank you for reminding us again that we are to serve you and to serve others with the attitude of a lowly servant. Very often we want to feel entitled or we want to feel as if we are the chief servant rather than being the lowly servant. Lord, forgive us. And we ask, Lord, right now that you help each one of us change our attitude that, Lord, we will become just like you, willing to take up the towel and to do those things, Lord, that may seem menial and lonely. Because, Lord, we will love you and we want to follow, follow in your chapter. Lord, we thank you and we pray that you continue to speak to us and we pray that throughout this week, Help us to find opportunities to serve you and to serve others. We pray this in Jesus' name.